Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us. In case you didn't know where you are, this is Left Bank Books presents New York Times best-selling author of six novels, Riley Sager, who will discuss his newest thriller that is the work of a master storyteller, A House Across the Lake. Tonight's event is possible because of your support. When you support Left Bank Books, your money goes directly into the local economy. It helps keep our bookstore open, and it also helps keep the streets paved, your libraries funded, your parks free, and so many other things that make St. Louis a better place. And for those of you from out of town, I know you two drove four hours to be here this evening. Did anyone drive farther? We have some people watching virtually that are like, oh, I'm farther away than that. Uh, well, I was. I would like to also welcome the virtual audience. Hello, thank you all so much for joining us this evening. I am Shane Mullen, I am the events coordinator for Left Bank Books. I help produce our hundreds of author events each year with a fantastic team here in St. Louis, including Evan and Amanda. Amanda is one of Riley's biggest fans, so uh, I would say you could art wrestle her to see if like, yeah, you're a bigger fan than she is. But she's pregnant, so don't do that. <laughs> we are so happy to be doing more in-person events this summer. We are still producing virtual events that will go out into the virtual world. So if you are unable to join us in person for an event, look for us online. And be sure to check out our event calendar for where our events are. They have them all over the city virtually. Um, next week, we have the incredible award-winning, national book award-winning author, I think that's two weeks from now, uh, Jason Mott for his national book award-winning book, Hell of a Book, which I highly recommend. In July, we will be back here at the Ethical Society for one of my favorite mystery authors, Ruth Ware. She will be coming all the way from the UK uh, to join us here. So be sure to check out our event calendar for all of those events and more. And now, I know I get distracted when I mention Ruth Ware too. I'm like, oh yeah. Um, tonight's book. Why you are here. Be careful what you watch for. Casey Fletcher, a recently widowed actress trying to escape a streak of bad press, has retreated to the peace and quiet of her family's lake house in Vermont. Armed with a pair of binoculars and several bottles of bourbon, she passes the time watching Tom and Catherine Royce, the glamorous couple living in the house across the lake. They make for good viewing. A tech innovator, Tom is powerful and a former model, Catherine is gorgeous. One day on the lake, Casey saves Catherine from drowning and the two strike up a budding friendship. But the more they get to know each other and the longer Casey waits, it becomes clear that Catherine and Tom's marriage isn't as perfect as it appears. When Catherine suddenly vanishes, Casey immediately suspects Tom of foul play. When she, what she doesn't realize is that there is more to the story than meets the eye and that shocking secrets can lurk beneath the most placid of surfaces. Packed with sharp characters, psychological suspense, and gasp-worthy plot twists, Bradley Sager's The House Across the Lake is the ultimate escapist read, no lake house required. Simone St. James, the New York Times bestselling author of The Book of Cold Cases, says, The House Across the Lake pulls you under on the first page and doesn't let you come up for air. With fascinating characters, a suffocating setting, and an intriguing premise, Riley Sager relentlessly turns up the tension on every page. Good luck putting this book down. Riley Sager is the New York Times bestselling author of six novels, most recently Home Before Dark and Survive the Night. A native of Pennsylvania, he now lives in Princeton, New Jersey. And now, if you would all please help me warmly welcome our fantastic guest for the evening, Riley Sager. So did someone say Ruth Ware? <laughs> like, um, she's awesome. She's one of my favorites. And she's my bottom. And um, did you all see that Kristen Bell Netflix show? Yes. yes. When that show, it was, it, it was a couple weeks, and um, Ruth was emailing me about something. And then at the end of the email, she put, 
Have you seen that Kristen Bell Netflix show? <laughs> I don't know if we should be offended or flattered. And I was like, flattered. We have to think that it's flattery. And I think it was flattery because that show really kind of had a loving regard for books like this. And in fact, one of the books she was reading in the show was The Woman Across the Lake. And I thought that was hysterical and also I was very nervous that people would like judge my book harshly or something because of a Netflix thing. But anyway, um, first I will read a little bit from The House Across the Lake and then I will talk a little bit more about The House Across the Lake and then you guys are going to ask me all sorts of intense probing questions. Okay, you better. So, the lake is darker than a coffin with the lid shut. That's what Marty used to say back when we were children and she was constantly trying to scare me. It's an exaggeration to be sure, but not by much. Lake Green's water is dark, even with the light trickling through it. A coffin with the lid cracked. Out of the water, you can see clearly for about a foot beneath the surface before it starts to get cloudy, then inky, then dark as a grave. It's worse when you're fully submerged, the shimmer of light coming from above in stark contrast to the black depths below. When we were kids bobbing in the middle of the lake, Marty often dared me to swim past the point of visibility until I touched the bottom. I tried many times, but never succeeded. Lost in the darkness, I always got disoriented, turned around, swam up when I thought I was headed down. I'd emerge breathless, confused, and slightly unnerved by the difference between water and sky. On the surface, it was bright as day. Just below, the night waited. On shore, five houses sit beside the dark water of Lake Green, ranging in style from comfortably quaint to conspicuously modern. In the summer, when the Green Mountain State is at full splendor, and each house is packed with friends, family members, and weekenders. They glow like beacons, signaling safe port. Through the windows, one can see well-lit rooms filled with people eating and drinking, laughing and arguing, playing games, and sharing secrets. It changes in the off-season, when the houses go quiet, first during the week, then on weekends as well. Not that they're empty, far from it. Autumn, autumn lures people to Vermont just as much as summer. But the mood is different, muted, solemn. By mid-October, it feels like the darkest of the lake has flooded the shore and seeped into the houses themselves, dimming their light. This is especially true of the house directly across the lake. Made of glass, steel, and stone, it reflects the chilly water in the gray autumn sky, using them to mask whatever might be happening inside. When the lights are on, you can see past the surface, but only so far. It's like the lake in that regard. No matter how much you look, something just beneath the surface will always remain hidden. I should know. I've been watching. And now I'm going to come over here because I have to feel like a professor. <laughs> this thing on? We're all good? Okay. So the house across the lake is basically the rear window on the lake. And um, and the other books about women who drink too much and look through windows and spy on the neighbors and see something suspicious. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and the reason I, I chose the, to do it is one, I thought it was a very good topic to do, like during the pandemic when everyone was kind of stuck inside, maybe drinking too much and maybe just looking out the windows. But also it was really inspired by a, a trip I made to a lake house in Vermont, which may or may not coincidentally bear a direct resemblance to the house in the book. <laughs> and it was October 2020 and um, all vacation plans were shot to heck and I just needed to get out of the house. So we thought, okay, let's let's rent a lake house in Vermont, because Vermont is pretty, and I like it there. So like, we rented a lake house in Vermont, and it's this beautiful old house. It's right next to the water. The porch is like basically hanging over the water, and there are these rocking chairs on the porch. So we go there, and the very first night, I pour myself a bourbon. I go out on the porch, and what catches 
my attention the lit houses on the other side of the lake. And my first instinct was this, I literally did this. <laughs> Who lives there? What's their life like? Have they murdered anyone? <laughs> and, like, it just got me thinking about like, River window on the lake. That's the, the first thing that popped into my head. I was like, this really could be my next book. I think it should be my next book. And then, you know, I got that little voice in my head. It's like, it's been done before. A lot. Like, a lot. And so I thought, okay, so if I'm really going to do River window on the lake, I need to come up with something crazy different to make it stand out. Because otherwise, what's the point? I don't want to, like, emulate other people. I wouldn't do my twist on things. And so I spent most of that week sitting out on that porch, sometimes with a bourbon or two, and just plotting out the book. And then I came upon like, aha, this is what I'm going to do different. And that's the spoiler part, and I can't say anything about that. So we'll go back to the beginning and talk about the plot. And it involves a woman named Casey. She is an actress, a fairly well-known actress. And um, her mother is a Broadway darling. And if Casey bears a slight resemblance to someone who played Princess Leia, it, yeah, there's a little bit of direction. <laughs> and so Casey's had a rough go of things. Um, her husband drowned at the lake. Um, she has an alcohol problem. She has been fired from a Broadway show for showing up drunk. And so her mother gives her an ultimatum rehab or go to the family's lake house in Vermont and dry out. Casey chooses the lake house, although not to dry out. And while she's there, she meets Tom and Catherine, the glamorous couple um, in the house across the lake. And they are just perfect, like disgustingly perfect. And Casey doesn't really <coughs> want to befriend Catherine, but Catherine is kind of likable. And so they strike up this budding friendship, and there are signs that maybe their marriage isn't as perfect as it seems. And so Casey, out of concern, of course, just kind of observes with binoculars constantly <laughs> at the house across the lake. And, um, see some things that might be a little bit shady, and then one day Catherine is gone. And that's when Casey really starts to think, uh-oh, did Tom do something to her? And so Casey decides to take it upon herself to investigate what happened in the house across the lake. And it was really, really fun to write, like more than I expected it to. Like, my books, they sort of alternate. Like I either do one like really, really quickly and easily, and it's it's, it's kind of fun. And then the next one is usually just torture. And so, survive the night was it was a little mix of both because of the pandemic. Like it was hard writing at all because I had trouble concentrating because everything was insane. So when it came time to write the house across the lake, I didn't know like what to expect. Is this going to be the, the hard, difficult one? And it ended up being so much fun to write that I actually got it done like two months early. I told my editor and agent, like, they've had it in August, maybe, and like the first week of June. Like, here it is, it's done. And so it just was probably the most fun I've had writing a book. And I hope it comes through in the writing. And I hope that you guys have a lot of fun reading it. Now, the fun part. Questions? Give me all your questions. Yes? Okay, so I'm wondering, so we're all teachers, and as teachers, we tend to work backwards sometimes, like with a test, vote with one test on first, and then go through how the lesson will look. So when you're writing, do you focus on plot twists first, and then form the story around that, or do you start with the storyline and think, okay, where do I maybe want this to go with the twist? I start with the storyline first. I do come up with, um, with they, they call it the elevator pitch in Hollywood where it's just like two sentences that you can give to a film exec and you ever read them in an elevator. And so, for example, with this one, it was rear wind wall. And then once that's established, it becomes the next step. Who is going to populate the story? Who do I want to 
be the main character and, and, and what's her deal and, and how is she messed up because all of my characters are messed up. <laughs> and so like I, I chose an actress because I really liked the idea of the person doing the watching is someone who has also been watched. Like she's been on the stage. Like her job is to be observed. And so I thought that was a very nice ironic twist to suddenly have her be the one looking at people. And she even describes the house across the lake as looking like a stage set, like lit for performance. And so then, you know, thinking about the other side characters, like Tom and Catherine Royce, I wanted them to also have a little bit of experience with like being watched or watching. So I made Catherine a model because she was on billboards, she was in magazines, and now suddenly she's gone. And so I really like playing with that as someone who's so visible suddenly being invisible. And then her husband is a tech guru who created this app that is called Mixer. And I, I call it like LinkedIn with booze. Because it's, it's basically like you can share with like your connections, like your favorite bars and restaurants and things. But part of it is there is a tracking part of it, and so people who sign up for the app like can see where other people who sign up for the app are, and yes, that comes into play in the plot. But that was also a fun thing to do of like, and here we have Tom, who is like, literally tracking people with his app. So there's a lot of different play of like watching and being watched and tracking people, and what's the ethics of it all? especially in this day and age with social media. Like everyone is on Instagram. And so like they're kind of inviting voyeurism. It kind of not exactly, but you know what I'm saying. Like they you know they're they want to be watched and then it just all these thorny wonderful issues. And that's another reason why I chose with like Rear Window as like my basis for this is because Rear Window had these amazing <laughs> questions of ethics and you know in the movie they call them Rear Window Ethics. Like, is this okay to be watching what we're watching even if someone might be in danger and we think we're helping them? And it just, it's, it's fascinating as a writer and it's fascinating as someone who like reads and consumes movies, the same kind of questions. Oh, then I come up with the plot. So I the rest. <laughs> and then I come up with the twist, and then I plot the rest of the book leading to the twist. Okay. Yes, sorry, I got it. I got way away from myself. Yeah. Uh, so your books, I read all of them. They have a lot of different settings, and I know you talked about how you come up with the settings, but it's because you're kind of there. But what inspires you to create the setting, and then with that, do you have a story in mind, and then think of the setting? Or you're in a setting and then you think, okay, the story can flip something. Does that sound? Yeah, it, it, it really depends on the book. Like this one was kind of, oh, I'm, I'm in this house and it's cool and there are full houses across the lake and we're really like, yeah, I'm just going to set it exactly right here. Oh, and fun fact, I always forget to say this. So while we were at this house, the Wi Fi wasn't working. So someone had to come and fix the Wi Fi. And Fixed it, and then he's like, Wi-Fi is fixed. And as we were sitting on the porch looking out at the water, and he said, you know, who else really liked to sit there when she stayed here? And we were like, who? Dolly Parton. <laughs> we were in the same lake house that Dolly Parton had been in. How awesome is that? And that's, there, has, it's not related to anything with the book, but it's really fun to tell it. And like literally the rest of the week, we were going like, did Dolly use the spoon? <laughs> did Dolly sit in his chair? And so that's, yeah. So I owe it all to Dolly, really. <laughs> but then in other cases, and again, I digress. But like with Home um, Lock Every Door, like I knew I had to sort of create this creepy apartment building. And so that one was plot first and then location second. Same with Only for Dark. Other questions? Yes? If there was one character that you wrote that you had to partner with to survive the apocalypse, whatever, <laughs> <laughs> you 
goodness. Um, that's a, that is, I'm going to say, um, I'm going to say Jules from Lock Every Door because she has some fine moments toward the end of that book where you don't want to mess with her. So, yeah, I'll, I'll say Jules and Lock Every Door. What would you do? I just read this one today, so. So Maggie? Yeah. Maggie's Maggie, I like her. She's probably bonkers half the time anyway, because the fingers are coming out. Any other questions? Maybe about my process, my previous books, who I like to read? Yeah. Um, if you had to pick one of your books to be turned into a movie, which one would you want and who would you want to be? <laughs> This is interesting because all of them have been optioned and are in some stages of development, which doesn't mean a movie is going to get made or a TV show. Because Hollywood is very, very weird. And um, what happens is usually, sometimes it's after a book comes out, but usually before the book comes out, like you will start to get more, you're like, oh, this production company is interested, or this person's interested. And so you will have a meeting sometimes, and then you will outline their vision for the book and things like that. And then, you know, if the deal is made and they option it, they have a set amount of time to sort of get it greenlit. And after that, I literally don't know how it works. Like, <laughs> some people are really, really good at being able to adapt their own books and, like, Megan Abbott was like executive producer or showrunner on like the Dare Me limited series on her book, and Julian Flynn wrote the screenplay of Gone Girl. I would not know how to do any of that. So I just sort of say, like, here's the book. <laughs> have my lesson. I'm here if you have any questions. No one has ever asked me a question. I'm still waiting for the questions. But then it just becomes a matter of waiting to see if something. And so, like, some of the books are just kind of languishing. Others, um, two of them, there are directors attached, including this one. <laughs> but I can talk about it. But so it's, so I, I don't really like to say, like, which one would I like to see <coughs> because it might actually happen one day. And same thing when I don't like to talk about, like, who I would like to cast in the movie because sometimes it could actually happen <laughs> maybe fingers crossed but it's, it's just such a weird thing like the whole hollywood thing like there were like a thousand groups to jump through to get something made and i think i've cleared maybe five of them fingers crossed, fingers crossed yeah <laughs> and if, if it never happens I'm, I'm literally okay with that because i i'm one of those people who think a book is enough. Like some people just are like, no, it has to turn into a movie. Like, a book is enough for me at least. Yes? Could you tell a little bit about your writing process? Like how did you start writing? How did you get into writing? Like what was the kind of process that you used to get into writing? Like how did you approach like that part of the writing process? For me, it's once I get that idea, and that could be the hard part because I get a lot of ideas all the time and I never write anything down because I think that if you can't stop thinking about it, then it's worth exploring. And so some ideas just leave my head like the next day and then some stick with me for weeks or months. And those are the ones that it's like, someday I'm gonna have to write this. But the actual writing itself, I'm like pretty, Kind of boring to be honest. It's you know I, I write a book a year. My publisher really wants me to do that, and I'm lucky enough in that like that's my only job, and so I don't really have an excuse to not write a book a year. So it really is just a matter of when I'm in full on writing mode, just getting up, getting in front of that laptop, and I set usually a schedule of like. Okay, this is the work I need to meet today, or this is the chapter I need to finish, and then it's just get it done. 
and there's nothing magical about it, and it's actually very, very just the way anyone does their job. <laughs> and I, I wish that I, I had like some elaborate ritual that I did. And no, I just sit down and I just sort of struggle and get the words on the page. So well, all of your books are like horror thriller based. So like when you were growing up, was that something that was really prevalent? Like my sister and I, we've been watching horror movies since before we were like old enough to be watching horror movies. <laughs> And so that's what she and I both read, and we still are so into like horror. And since that's like kind of what you write, is that something that you've always been like into and like around, or is that something that happened like later? I always like scary stuff. Like one of my favorite things was Halloween around Halloween time. They would always show like, and I'm, I'm dating myself here, but like it was like a wonderful world of Disney, and at Halloween they would have like. Their Halloween special it was just clips from all their scariest Disney moments, including The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. And I loved that as a kid. It terrified me as a kid. And then as I got a little bit older, I discovered Alfred Hitchcock. And one of the reasons I just really was curious about Alfred Hitchcock is they did a revival of Alfred Hitchcock Presents in the mid 80s. And for some reason, I just really wanted to see it. And my mom said, no. He makes movies where they peck birds, peck people's eyes out. <laughs> you do not tell that to a child, because they really, really, really want to see Alfred Hitchcock movies from then on. And so like, I just, like, starting when like 12 or 13, I just really got into Hitchcock. Like, Vertigo, and Rear Window, and North London, so like, like, all of that. And that just, I've always had this love of the macabre and the, the creepy, and like, I really wasn't into like real horror movies until Scream came along. Yeah. And I saw that and just went, oh my gosh, this is what they're like? They can be this good? Because they always had such a bad reputation. And so it's it just, luckily for me, like this interest and hobby turned into a career. Thank you. Thank you. What's your favorite scary movie? <laughs> uh, my Soul to Take, Wes Craven. Which one? My Soul to Take, Wes Craven. I never saw that. Yeah, it's one of his like lesser known ones. What's yours? Really into the Lignet right now. <laughs> 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 so it just came out. But The Shining is my favorite of all time. Well, that is a classic. Mm -hmm. I saw you. Yep. Uh, we have a lot of really incredible fans. We love them here this evening. I'm wondering if you have any celebrity fans. Yes, one, and it was very, very weird. Um, <laughs> but in a good way. But, but when Lock Every Door came out, um, a friend of mine like, just posted on Facebook because she followed um, this actress on Instagram who posted that she was reading Lock Every Door and it was really good. And the actress was Sarah Michelle Gellar. And so I'm like, oh my gosh, this is Buffy, he's reading my book, and she likes it. <laughs> and so, but the, the weirdest part was when the next year when Home Before Dark came out, she sent me a direct message. Buffy DM'd me. <laughs> and it was a picture of the book, and she just said, starting it now, can't wait. And so I'm like, do I reply? So I replied, like, oh, that's awesome. It's really creepy. And then she wrote back instantly, like, oh, that's great. I love creepy. And I was like, and this was like midnight on a Friday night. I'm like, I am DMing Buffy right now. <laughs> and and that, that was like very, very surreal and wonderful. But other than that, and you know, like I'm still waiting for the telescope moment. <laughs> it's going to happen, guys. So, <laughs> Well, yes, because it, I, the, the epigraph is, I think he did it, but I just can't uh, exactly. Yes. And that was a flavor attempt to get her to know who I am. <laughs> and I'm sure the restraining order was like waiting for me at home right now. <laughs> um, but, yes. So, Kate.
keeping on the theme, I was going to ask how if music plays a role in your writing process and if there's any songs you specifically associate with this book. Only nobody in front with this book. Um, and it, it, it varies from book to book. Like with um, Survive the Night, I did do a playlist of the songs that were sort of mentioned in the book or that inspired the book or the mood of the book. And that one was very cool because it took place in 1991 and I was a senior in high school then. And so I got to make a playlist of like my moodiest, greatest hits from high school. And that was enjoyable. Okay. But as the, when I'm writing, I do listen to music, but it's Spotify playlist, like I get like show house music with no words because when like I hear words, it really messes me up. But I put on the headphones, I listen to like this chill Spotify playlist and just do my writing and it gets me in the groove. And there was one playlist that I listened to nonstop when writing about every tour to the point where I guess artists can see like how many it was like a, a band that like was part of this playlist sent me emails thank you and I was like I don't know who you are it's on the playlist but thank you I'm sure I like it but I'm sure it's on. Yes. Uh, could you tell me about why you choose a female narrator and if that is challenging? Yeah, sure. It, it started with Final Girls, which was about a Final Girl, and you all know what Final Girl is, yeah. And I just knew it had to be narrated by a Final Girl. There was just no question. And that was like literally all the thought I gave to it. It didn't make me think, oh, I can't do this, or I shouldn't do this. It's just, I'm going to tell her story. And she's going to narrate it. And it worked. And I thought I pulled it off kind of pretty well. And so when it came time to like write a follow up book, it was like, if it ain't broke, I'll try it again. And but at the same time, I also know that like, you know, my experience is different and it's limited. And so the first thing I do is I think of character first and gender second. So when I'm writing someone, I don't think of like, oh, like, you know. What would a woman do in this situation? I think, what would Casey, based on all the stuff she's gone through and all the things she's dealing with in her past and her mother, all that, like, what would she specifically do in this situation? And so I find that very, very helpful. And then when it comes time for editing and revising, the first person who reads anything I write is a very dear friend of mine. I know her since high school. I said her stuff before, I sent it to my editor. And she will tell me, like, she texts me in real time, like, what she kind of thinks of the book and where she thinks it's going. And she is not afraid to tell me when I get something wrong. And so, like, in Survive the Night, um, the main character, Charlie, is in a car with a shaky guy named Josh. And they're about to set off on this road trip. And Josh stops and gets coffee, and he hands her a cup of coffee. And I had kids, and Charlie just be like, oh, thanks, and drink it. And my friend went, no, no woman would do that. And I was like, duly noted, thank you. And so now, Charlie does not. She pretends to take a sip of my coffee. And so she's like the first line of defense. And then I have my editor and my agent, and they're also very savvy and very smart, and also like not afraid to be like, yeah, you got this wrong. You got to change it. And so, we make all together a really great team. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I saw. Yes. Uh, we have a question from the virtual audience. Oh, cool. Yes. Uh, Kenneth is asking, uh, can you tell us more information about Home of Fort Garden and all the research you did for that book? It is my absolute favorite of his books. Oh, cool. Thank you. Um, yeah, Home Before Dark, it was inspired by the Amityville Horror. And I was listening to a wonderful podcast called Stuff You Should Know. I think you heard it. It's great. And they just do random topics. And one day they were going the Amityville hoax, basically, because it didn't happen. Come on. And and it just got me thinking about the family involved, because there were kids, like and these kids have now like grown up with this 
clearly made up ghost story, like trailing them their whole life. They got me thinking about what must it be like to be one of the Amityville children. And so that thought was a great idea for character. Someone whose parents made up a very, very famous, very, very popular haunted house tale. And so that was Mag. And I wanted to explore that, but I also wanted to tell the tale that her parents told. So hence, there is the book within a book. There's the book her father wrote, and then there's Maggie's experience returning to the house 25 years later. As for research, I made it all up. Like it was, it was really fun. Like just the, the, the house was sort of based on an old bed and breakfast that I'd stayed at in Vermont. There's something to me about Vermont and buildings that I've stayed at that end up with the books. But other than that, like it just was it was really fun to just create a haunted house from scratch and create all the ghosts and its history and all that kind of fun stuff. Okay, so you're an autobiography author first and foremost. Like you could publish your own book and I'd be like, yes, five stars. Oh great, because I'm gonna explain. Oh good. I'm hoping for it. Really, really fast. Um, so who is your like thriller author or like you're inviting they put out Regardless, and you just love their, their stuff. Like, I want to know like, what authors This is not a callback joke, although it could be for And um, <laughs> and Megan Miranda, and Jennifer Hillier, and yeah, they're, they're like my three, and they're all wonderful people too. So that, it also helps that like, I know them and I like them, but they also write amazing, amazing books. Yes. Um, a lot of your books have been um, either like early release or whatever your book of the month. Do you like contact them about like how does that all work? Do you like have a partnership with them? Do they just like love you? What's what's their <laughs> I guess like process for that? The honestly the, the question I get asked the most is is it gonna be book of the month selection? <laughs> and that this is the thing. We aren't allowed to say. So whenever anyone asks me that, I just ignore the question because we cannot say if we are, we can't say if we're not. And it really, I don't have anything to do with it. Like it's, it's, they just decide or not. And then if they do, they'll, they tell the editor or the you know, publicist and marketing person and then we just can't say until it is or isn't a selection. So yeah, it's, it sounds so mysterious, but it's, it's really not. Like, they, they read a lot of books and they like a lot of people, and you know they've been very, very supportive of me. And you know I've, I've got to meet some of them, and I'm always willing to like, you know, be a. a, a they used to call them guest judges, but now they're like recommenders. Yes, you back. When you read thriller books, do you read it as a fan or as an author? It depends on the book and um, why I'm reading it. Because sometimes I'm reading something just because it's super popular or because I need to keep up with trends in the genre, and so it becomes more work. It's like, okay, this is a sign reading. And then there are other times where I just read it because I'm a fan. And sometimes, like, it, it changes. Where like the book I'm reading as a fan or want to be a fan, I'm like. Mm, I see that plot twist coming. I see, mm, you, could have, you could have polished this one a little bit more. <laughs> but then other times, like the one that I think is like just required reading, I'm like, oh, this is good. Yeah, I'm into this. This is really great. So it, it, it varies. But my reading has changed a lot because, one, I tend not to read a lot of fiction when I'm writing because you have the potential to, one, inadvertently copy someone's style, but to make yourself feel really, really bad if you're reading something really, really good. And that's happened where I'm like, yeah, my writing's going great, and then I'll read something that's just like a flat out masterpiece. And it's been like, I suck. <laughs> and so it really it messes with your head. Do you normally have to do research for your books, or has a better book where you just sit down and it just comes to you without having to really research anything about that book? 
It really depends on the book. Sometimes I need to do some research. Usually it's geography. Like with um, Lock Every Door, I because it's set in the Upper West Side, basically where the Dakota is. And so I knew I need to go to that area and like get the feel of the lay of the land and all that stuff. And so I did spend an afternoon staking out the Dakota, which is not a good idea. But I, and I did try to get in, but I just was like walking past and like, peeking through the arch and like sort of checking out who's coming and going. But the, the one part I was like, I was sitting there and I just was pretending to like read my phone, but I was actually taking pictures of the exterior. And because there was one window that I thought was really cool that had these wonderful wooden shutters, and I was like, oh, what a nice like, kind of visual. Maybe I'll put that in the book. And then I got home and I was like, doing some more research on the Dakota. And it was Bill Ono's apartment. And I felt like bad that I was like, taking creeper pictures in my co apartment. But I have to say, the apartment in Lock Every Door is not based at all on the Dakota. There's nothing going on in the Dakota, like it's what happens in this book. It just happens to be geographically in the same place. <laughs> Disclaimers aren't for it. Yes. <laughs> My book I'm writing now is set in 1983. So yes, yes. <laughs> Technology makes it very, very difficult to be a thriller writer because everything is at just touch of your hand, like, oh, I need help. Okay, got help. And so it was survived the night. I knew that I, it had to be set like way before cell phones and GPS because the book would have been literally five pages. <laughs> Charlie would have been like, okay, let me Google this guy. Okay, no. Nope. And that would have been the book. And so I probably will keep going back to the past because it is so much easier to do a side run around all technology. And it makes things more fun as a writer and probably for the reader. And I mean, we value our cell phones. Man, they're hard to like, use in a plot and like make it work. Like with Final World, they did like the, oh, signal is spotty and you know, we don't want anyone taking pictures during our party in this cabin. So they all go in the car and it just was like, I, as I was writing them, like, this is so bad. But it had to be done. Because again, cell phones would have ended the plot completely. There was. Yes. Yes. What was the. So the first book that you published, was it the first book that you wrote? Or did you write some before that never made it publication? Oh, my history. So you all know that Ryan Sig is not my real name, right? Yes. And that's generally acknowledged. And the reason for that is um, I wrote three books under my real name, and they didn't sell well at all, like, at all, like, really bad. And um, so when I wrote Final Girls, I sent it to my agent, and she was like, this is really good. This is the best thing you've ever written. This could be, this could be a breakup book. You're going to need to be some pen. And I'm like, no, I want my name on this book. And she really laid it out for me. Because the publishing industry, sometimes you're only as good as your last sale. And if your last sale wasn't that good, you don't have much of a shot. And so my, my agent said, you could put your name on this book. And every editor I send it to will look up your previous sales. And they will give you a crappy advance and crappy publicity and a crappy cover, and she didn't say crappy, by the way. She was, yeah. And she was no nonsense then. And she said, hey, this book will end up exactly like all your other books, and I know you don't want that to happen. And I didn't. And so um, that's how Riley Sager was born. And it, never in a million years did I think like 
I'd be here talking to you guys and have several bestsellers under my belt and, and all the wonderful things that have happened. It's been crazy. You first, and then okay. So kind of going on that while you get about it. So then looking at like your folks under your name, have you noticed a change in writing since like? I think they're all out of print. Oh. I don't think they're even available as as e-books. Oh, okay. Well, I look at the memory now. I wonder if you're able to change now. People that only are to like if they go back and oh, where you now? I have these right sacred books. Yeah, I, I think some people have, but I. They're, they're not that good to be <laughs> To be frank, they're they're okay. They're not great. Like I, I think in Final Girls is not my voice. Okay. And you had a question. Oh, I was bouncing off of other questions, but uh, so is there a story around where Riley said your writing came from? Yeah, but Sager is my grandmother's maiden name. And Riley, my first instinct was to use initials and my based off my parents' names, Ray and Linda. So for about two seconds I was R. L. Sager. <laughs> and yeah, you know, you know. <laughs> And it, then it was like, oh no, yeah, that, that's not gonna work. And so um but Riley was kind of like the match together, and so that that's how it became and I didn't think when I was like, yep, yeah, okay, let's do Riley Sager, and Aiden said, yeah, sure. That, like, I have to be signing it, like, <laughs> many, many, many times. Now I'm really good at it, but the first time you sign a name that's not your own, it's weird. It's so weird. <laughs> I would double the, like, commercial appeal of being an artist for the film. Is artist for the film a thing? Well, no, <laughs> no, I mean, it, it, no, that's a very good question because I, I do, like, I know my limitations as a writer, but I also know what I do well. And so, like, I know that I'm not doing, like, great literature, but I serve a niche and a need, and I think that I do it well, and I try very hard at it. And so, it really becomes a matter of what do you want to spend a year working on? Because the, the, the process can be so long. As you write the book, and that could take sometimes you know nine months, a year, and then there's the revising and the editing, and then there's you know when the book comes out, and then you have to you know you talk about it, and so you need something that's going to excite you through that whole entire long process because you do not want to finish a book and then be like. I don't. So that's for me. That's like more important than like you know artistic fulfillment. But it comes hand in hand because it's the thing that I want to be writing. Like this was the book that like yeah I want to write this. And what survived the night? It was yeah I want to write this book about like two people in a car and that's mostly it. And so it, I don't get any pressure to start my publisher to do anything different. Like, never have I proposed something and then gone, mm, could you do something different? So they've, they've been very supportive the whole time. Did I see? Yes. Um, so you've asked me my favorite scary movie and I forgot to ask you yours. So what would it be? <laughs> it's probably Scream. Okay, that's what I figured. It'd be yeah. Scary. But Halloween is also right up there as well. And then what is your favorite, like your all-time favorite book? Did we asked about your authors, like what is like your all-time oh, favorite book? Oh, my all-time favorite book. I need to kill a mockingbird. That's why I do! <laughs> but I, it's, it's honestly been such a long time since I've read it. I mean, I doubt I would like go back and reread it and be like, oh, this is crap. But I mean, it has been a long time since I've read that one. So that's like my favorite classic. Probably like my favorite of recent times is a book, and it's not a thriller, it's not scary at all. Beautiful Ruins by Jess Walter is a fantastic book. It's about World War II and Hollywood and life and regret, and it's, 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 it's an amazing book. Yeah, 
Chris. We have the same favorite, favorite book. That makes me very happy. Well, my favorite recent book would be Home Before Dark. So I feel like we have a good thing going. <laughs> we both love this. Craven, we're doing great. Let me see any, any other questions. Yes. Uh, continuing on the favorite theme, what is your favorite Taylor Swift song? <laughs> <laughs> it is, um, it is Blank Space. Yes. <laughs> yes. And there is there is a good story behind Blank Space, and I, it sounds like non Taylor Swift people in this room are going to be like, oh my God. <laughs> but so before I wrote Final Girls, I had been brought by my publisher and I had been laid off my newspaper job. So it was like a double whammy. And I had literally no idea what I was going to do with my life. And so I was just this, what am I going to do? And then 1989 came out. And in the song Blind Space, she sings, find out what you want, be that girl for a month. And in the context of the song, it's way different. But the first time I heard it, I was like, find out what you want, be that person. It's sort of what I took from it. And I wanted to be a best-selling author. I don't know why, but I did. And so it happened. And it's that's really so that, that song calls a special, special place. So we can thank Taylor Swift for all of your books is what you're telling us. Pretty much, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that that is that is her high water mark. Yeah. yeah. Any other? Yeah. So, in your story, your plot twists, you give us clues along the way. Um, do you have those clues panned out, or whenever you get to the end, you're like, oh, I need to add this thing, so that whenever they get to the end of the book, they're like, oh, I remember that. Usually they are planned out. I'm a big outliner, so when I'm writing something, I tend to just write chapter by chapter by chapter. Like, okay, this has to happen here. I need to plant this glue here. I need to do this red herring here. And so I try to think of that along the way, but then occasionally in revising, something else. You know, oh wait, yeah, I need to put this here. Right? Sometimes in the editing process, my editor will say like. You need to be a little more fair with the reader. So you need to like just mention this one more time, please. And so it's 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 part of the whole process. But they are very difficult to write because as the person who knows what the plot twist is, like I just think that whatever I do, it's so glaringly obvious and that like all of my plot twists will be failures, and that each like, like little clue I place is just this neon arrow, like clue, 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 clue. And so it's really not until someone else reads the book pretty much blind that if I know if like, the, the twist is working and the clues are well placed. Yes. A lot of actors. I see you there. <laughs> A lot of actors say they never go back and watch a movie once it's finished on screen. Go back and read your books once they're published. Not really, no. Occasionally, if a copy just happens to be like sitting there, I'll be like, oh, let's come through this. And, oh, I like that part. Yeah, that was good. But no, I haven't like, gone back and reread the whole thing because when you are writing and revising, you are reading that sucker probably like a dozen or more times. You really get sick of it. Like, even like, I love all my books. There's been a point of all of that where I just can't look at it anymore. Because you just it's so much. Yes. Well, that kind of plays into my question, but I was curious of other six books, which one was your favorite, or do you feel like they're all your favorite at the time? Or if you had to like rank them, where would they be? Oh gosh, well, no, I will never write that. <laughs> 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 and then I, I can't even like pick a favorite. Um, like, because my experience with all of them is, is unique, so there's really no comparing them. I mean, I'm proud of Final Girls because it literally changed my life. Um, I'm proud of The House Cross the Lake because it was so much fun to write. Um, but that doesn't mean like I don't like Survive the Night or I don't like you know The Last Time I Lied. It's, it's just those were sort of like the two kind of benchmarks. 
and, and some were, you know, Home Before Dark was not an easy book to write. It was, it was torturous. Who knew that a book within a book would be difficult to write? <laughs> I should have known, but I didn't until I actually started writing it. And I'm like, oh crap. But I got it done, and it's a really good book. But at the time, when I was finished, that was the special that book was like, I never want to see this book again. Because it was just so difficult. But time passes, and I'm like, I'm really proud of what I did with that book. So anyway, are we, uh, how are we for time? Uh, I mean, we can maybe take like one more question. Okay, like, anyway. Right 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 in the corner. Oh, I see, okay. <laughs> Sorry, the point was sort of behind me here. I see. When you finally finish a book and you send it to the editor, is it always sent back for revisions? And do you ever disagree with it? It's always a disagreement. <laughs> <laughs> and there are always disagreements. Yes. My editor is amazing. And um, I knew that we were going to have a special relationship when, in the editing process for Final Girls, there was something that she wanted me to do that I didn't want to do. And I was getting a little bit ornery. And she was like, Ooh, are we going to fight? Let's fight. So she, like, she like, really involved it. She wanted to, like, I had this wonderful process. And so like we now have like this kind of shorthand like where I know as I'm writing it that there are going to be things that she'll ask me to do. And so I just go ahead and put them in before she even asks me to. And in, in some cases, like with Lock Every Door, it's funny, she finished editing, she sent it back to me, I realized it and all that stuff. And then she's like, okay, I think we're good. And I'm like, mm, are we? She's like, yeah, we're good. Don't I need two more weeks to like change a little bit more? And like, I was arguing with my editor, like, to please may I edit more? And she let me. And like, I finished the edits, and then she read it again, and she's like, yeah, you were right. And so we have a great relationship, and she's she's awesome. But there are always disagreements. But she respects when I like sort of. If I give her a reason for why something needs to stay. She'll let it stay. But at the same time, she needs to give me a reason that something needs to go. So it's a great push pull. Any more questions before we Yes. Um, so I'm a new fan. Learned tonight that, you, that this is not your real name. So is that your real author bio? Like, do you actually live in Princeton? Or is it on <laughs> yes, <I> actually, yes. <laughs> I actually live in Princeton, yes. Okay. <laughs> Don't stop me. <laughs> On that note, maybe we should. <laughs> All right, we're going to do the signing in the lobby, and we do have books available for sale out there as well. So.